Welcome to the Spirit Sessions podcast. I'm your guide, Katie Silcox, bringing you your weekly self-love soundbite. Join us where I'll help you find your true spiritual home, where every single aspect of you is holy ground. Hi everyone, Katie here. This podcast is intended to inspire you, educate you, and most importantly, support you on your journey towards knowing who you really are, that inner self, that inner teacher. I am not a psychologist or a medical doctor and do not offer professional health or medical advice on this podcast. If you are suffering from any kind of psychological or medical issue, please do the right thing and seek help from your qualified health professional. Santa baby, slip a sable under the tree for me. I've been an awful good girl, Santa baby, so hurry. goodness it is christmas time it's your girl katie silcox can you tell i have had a lot of green tea and i am also fully fully in that red ruby spirit of christmas you guys this is gonna be probably my favorite podcast i can already feel it i am here to bring us good tidings of comfort and joy santa baby Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would the world be if there were no Santa Claus? That was written by Francis Forcellus Church in a very famous New York Post response to a little girl who had written him, Does Santa exist? So guys, while we all hang our lights on our trees and go out and buy our kids gifts around us, uh, winter is a real thing. And I think it's important to take a moment to feel the way that trillions of organisms have undergone a mass death. We may not know it, but we can feel it. We're natural beings. The, these natural bones, these natural blood pulsing, it is a loss, a grief, a sense in winter that things are falling apart. And so if out there you all in podcast land are feeling, you know, I'm feeling like there's a deconstruction happening in me, it makes sense. Welcome to winter. I want to talk in this podcast about about one of our cultural artifacts of the holiday time no matter what background you're from, if you live in the Western world, especially in the United States, there's no escaping Santa. And I want to look at this myth-infused ritual through a depth psychology lens. I want to talk about Freud. I want to talk about Jung and how we can use this lens to really come deeper into the usual cultural experience of the Western world during this month of December and you know, you may be thinking, seriously, Silcox, Santa? <laughs> and, and to that alliteration, I would respond, yeah, there's a lot for us in this. So I hope that you can make a cup of tea, sit down, lay down, get in your car, whatever you're doing, and just let it, let it soak in. And I know I've spent the past few weeks studying the ritual, writing about the ritual, 
um, the myth. And I can't even tell you guys, like, there's such a renewal in my body and an excitement. I feel like a child again, like a puppy, like a puppy energy, like when we were little and we would wait on Santa. So coming up soon, the winter solstice is the longest night of the year. There's, as you all know, so much dark and so very little light. And we all know the statistics, right? That depression and suicide are the highest in the month of December. The National Institute for Health says that an estimated 10 million Americans are affected every year by seasonal affective disorder, and they often recommend vitamin D. (laughs) And guess what else? Light therapy. Of course, they're talking about... um, you know, physical light, but we can also think of it as metaphorical, and we need light during this time. You may hear me drinking a little bit of hot tea. Um, but yeah, our, our dark inner issues can often st- stand in such a stark relief to the holiday time, all of the lights, right? Our losses and failures and relational lonelinesses, they can feel somewhat like Uh, weird or unwelcome guests at a culture that insists on parties and abundance and nearly like a mania like mirth and for many people Christmas is a time when we remember Christmas has passed this is a season for many that isn't so much comforting but like a dim reminder of the people or pets or situations that we no longer share Christmas with. And all we have to do is look around at nature. She is our teacher. There is a black night of crystal clear air. It's like we're being held in this cold, dark pillow. Winter is so full of death. And yet, sprinkled with light. Most of Western culture has forgotten that the season of winter is meant to hold what Jung would call this tension of opposites, life and death, darkness and light. We have become culturally numb, forced only to revel in false Christmas light or hasten to a solitary corner to mourn our losses alone. We have forgotten the deeper meaning of our ancestors and their meanings. We don't know death in our culture, and therefore we can never resurrect into life. So what's so cool is that the deeper roots of our ancestors, our wintry ancestors, they they hold and wait for us this sort of revived holiday myth. The black shroud of night around us is actually the reason we can see the beauty of the Christmas lights in our neighbor's yards. And by really going into these archetypes, we can find a lot of healing and solace, but we have to spend the time. And I have found that depth psychology is a really great way in, especially for those of us that come from a Western background. And, you know, it's it's beyond the scope of this podcast to go into a deep definition of, of depth psychology, but basically it was it was coined in the early 20th century and associated with many psychologists, but most famously and notably Freud and Jung. And essentially, it's any psychology that really holds a primacy of the unconscious mind. What is that? It's a deep, sacred spelunking into the parts of our mind that are largely unknown to us. That's pretty interesting. Jung would say that I am not the master of my own house, Right? It's this humble recognition that we are not alone, meaning we can want one thing with our ego and then do other weird things. Right, We also dream every night. The depth psychology is by definition the unknown and therefore by logic um, can be defined as uh, well, really we can't really define it <laughs> and yet by like really diving into this possibility of the unconscious mind we can start to actually make it a little more conscious and we start to get this really magical fuller picture of who we are as individuals but what through what we will do today 
we can also see who we are as a society, as a culture, as a collective, as a global humanity. And we can start to gain insight into why are we having this weird, odd thing like inventing a myth about a man who rides on a sleigh accompanied by reindeer, one of them with a red nose. Essentially, this dude is engaging in like an inverse burglarizing scheme with the goal being pretty simple, like make children happy happy, and occasionally please lonely housewives. <laughs> yes, there is an eroticism to Santa that we are going to allow for, so let's turn our minds and hearts towards this cultural artifact and moment of our time called Christmas. And if we can do as maybe Sigmund Freud might do, we can just in a small way move our consciousness away from the religion of Christianity, um, which is certainly a, a massively important part of Christmas, of course, right? But if we can just go to the myth of Santa, we can start to go down into the soil of the collective substratum and maybe even try to understand what's going on in the collective. So it's this rich ancestral soil of our mind, of our psyche, where we can start to ask some questions. So what do these rituals and traditions of Santa, but also things like mistletoe and twinkling lights and red ribbon gifts tell us about the collective psyche, the instinctual, the body, the animal, what does it tell us about, I love this word, I want to share it with you, it's teleological quest. What does that mean? It means there's a part of you, dear listener, and me, and all of us, that is a teleos, meaning there's a part of us that knows the deeper meaning of our life, and it has an evolutionary path it is set upon, meaning we aren't alone. There's a bigger thing pulling and driving us, and it is us. And we can surrender into that. And so what archetypes inside us are being projected outward onto the natural wintry wonderland? And how can we use this sort of psychic root of our traditions to bring about more and a deeper sense of belonging to the season and belonging to the land and belonging to our people and belonging to our family? And my God, wouldn't it be great if we could feel just a little bit more of that this season, this feeling of deeply belonging to ourselves so what does sex death and 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 father christmas have to do with all of this well in pagan traditions december was the meeting ground of two forces the darkness of the season where natural death is seen around us all the time in nature but also this holding of the oppositional force of ceremonial light and gathering and presence and, yeah, joy. We can take a moment to just imagine the mind of our ancestors, particularly those in colder regions of the planet. We can kind of tune into them. We can imagine them without electric heating. They don't have, you know, full-length snuggy blankets and Netflix and chill. They know in a way that perhaps me and you don't they know the the like possibility of their annihilation physically for our ancestors all of that death of winter needed life all that darkness required the necessary compensation of light from a sort of felt body sense they knew death was possible they would rush around to gather warmth and food. And some of them knew they might not survive an uncertain winter. And, you know, we don't have to go back too far. I mean, I can think about my own ancestors and birth was really hard and death was really real. And and maybe we don't have to go even that far back to know that some of our ancestors knew that some of the tribe, some of the family wouldn't even survive winter and we still see this you guys old folks tend to die more in the month of december and so it it really makes sense that we have what what you know a jungian would call a, a collective compensation mechanism we at this time and our ancestors required hope 
in their lonely winter nights, they had to literally gather tight and sleep with one another. They ritualized a reminder in this time of spring's inevitable return, like, like remember, it's going to get warm again. And we can think about this metaphorically, a spiritual insight into our own dark night of the soul and the way that I know you guys have felt this, where it can feel that, that this coldness, this loneliness, this emptiness, this despair that we all go through as humans, it just will never go away. And so what's so beautiful about right now, what's so numinous about winter is that nothing lasts forever. And so we get this inherited ritual. We, we hang Christmas lights. We erect a, a living tree in the middle of the room. We kiss under the mistletoe. And we also wait for a loving father or a jolly abundance gift-bringing lover <laughs> to bring us something nice. <laughs> To understand Freud and, and Christmas, we, we need to first understand how he, he, you know, he gets a really bad rap. And the more I study Freud and I've spent the past few months really going deep into Freud, he was such a tantric. Freud really um, honored the primacy of the body's need for pleasure. People don't know that about Freud. This this misunderstanding of Freud is like some sicko that thinks that children, you know, secretly long to kill their father and, and sleep with their mother is just like a dense oversimplification and a gross error. What Freud actually gave permission for was what the tantrics gave permission for, and that was all of life is pulsing with eros, with sex, with that doesn't mean intercourse, right? It means life. It means the innate animal longing to be pleased, to feel safe, to feel comfort, to feel visceral body ecstasy. And so for him, there were two titan twin forces in the psyche. One was the the instinct of eros or, or sex or life and then death and he saw it, as I said, sexuality wasn't like just a genital experience for procreation, but really this, this pull to pleasure. Um, and, you know, we can also think of it as self-preservation. And then, of course, there is the instinct of death and destruction, which is the counterpole of that. And what's so cool is in his terminology, these instincts become, quote, repressed, causing that sex force, libido, of course, the tantrics called this kundalini, to divert the energy back towards, quote, fixations within the consciousness. So these repressed sex forces have to go somewhere and these repressed death forces have to go somewhere. So you and I are not so far away from this, right? Like we can... We can like think about it from the comfort of our, of our warm home. But as I'm looking out the window right now, I'm seeing lots of little squirrels. I mean, a couple. And what's so funny is like the squirrel temperament and personality and even body shape is so different right now than it is in, in the summer and the spring. Right now they are getting so cute and chubby and they're in what's called in the nature scene, we call it squirreling energy that it's like a mania. They go crazy trying to hoard nuts. And we're the same, right? In the winter, we're a little more driven to hoard, to hibernate. And we're also wanting like more of that hig, right? That cozy, that comfort, that snuggle vibe. And that's because we can feel it, even though we may be a little separated from the wintry outside nature wonderland, we can really feel it. And subconsciously, we're, or consciously, but for many of us subconsciously, we're remembering that we're all living on borrowed time. So Freud, interestingly enough, also talks about melancholia, melancholy, and how melancholy can be kind of a gathering place, he called it, for the death instinct. 
And what's so curious about this time is like, this is also the time when, as I said, depression and seasonal affective disorder, and we could call it a disorder, right? But we could also just talk, call it the natural feeling that it arises. And, and that is this sort of melancholy. And so these sex or pleasure rituals give us a place to neutralize that. Freud was amazing in that he warned us, don't, don't let this death instinct build up too much because it can become aggression. And so we create what pleases the passion during this time. We make presents with ribbons that are red, the color of our vital blood and its health. We hang mistletoe, which is green, this symbol of sex and everlasting life. Of course, we're going to kiss underneath it and all, you know, ooh, right? This is it. So here comes Santa Claus. And just as Christians right now, which I include myself as a spiritual Christian, uh, we Christians around the world celebrate our sun god, spiritual redeemer, Christ, we also celebrate our rewarding father, Claus. Santa holds the promise of this pleasure-seeking power. He is wish fulfillment, limitless possibility. He has a big red sack. It's red. He is chubby. He is abundant. He reminds us of the prosperity, both seasonally and psychologically. He is like a great neutralizer to all this melancholy of death. Now, I didn't know this until I started my research. Um, I knew a little bit about it, but it was interesting to find out that old Saint Nick was a Turkish monk from around 280 AD, so like really long ago. And he was a saint, and he was a trust fund baby who, instead of you know spending his wealth on himself, he gave away all his money to the poor, and he trekked around the area helping the less fortunate and and the ill and became very popular and was proclaimed a saint and he got really popular during the renaissance and he was made a saint and then even during the protestant reformation in europe where the protestants sort of got rid of all of the catholic saints they kept saint nick and he was brought to the united states to america by the dutch in the 18th century, and they called him Center Claus. And then, of course, during the industrial and capitalistic boom after that in the U.S., he became the sort of cartoonish character that, you know, I learned about when I was a little girl, and you probably did too. So Santa wasn't content on remaining a saint. Santa has now gone mythic. He is the father archetype remedy to our collective winter melancholy. Santa left his saintly trek on foot and he turned to sky flying, which interestingly is a common mythology component for the father, the sun god. Santa, as you know, and these are things like we may have never even thought about, but why does he go up and down a chimney? Well, Freud might say what an obvious sexual reference to this erotic member of the sun god, right? The phallus. He goes up and down the chimney. He leaves gifts for children, checking to see if they're naughty or nice. Again, this reference to the father that, that you know, in a Freudian sense, look, when you're born, you're with your mama. You're at her breast. You are one with the mother. You as a baby have no differentiation between your body and her body, right? Whereas the father, like from the sky, as if by magic, appears to the baby and usually hopefully gives a little cooing and love and then he disappears again. This is Santa, right? Through this magical upward force, Santa disappears in sort of a sparkly parabola, promising that he'll come back next year, just like the sun in the sky during winter. So, you know, there's the whole thing about the Oedipus complex, but there's something that I learned about that was amazing. I think it's pretty 
and again, none of this is truth, capital T. It's just ways of projecting our consciousness that are really interesting and I think give deeper meaning to our own lives and maybe help us understand our motivations a little better, which is what we do with depth psychology and is in fact the definition of yoga, right? To make that which is unconscious in me conscious. And so Freud came up with this thing called the Electra complex, which I wish, sometimes I wish my name was Electra. It's just such a good name. Um, and the Electra complex was this idea that in, you know, and, and of course you have to remember where they were during their time, men and women were like two very discrete boxes. And of course, biologically, that's 99.999% of the time true, but they spoke in terms of, of men and women. And he said, although we could certainly apply this to any, any gender identification, but that women had an unconscious longing for the father, not in, like I said, in a genital way, but in, in this longing for the pleasure of abundance and approval. Um, and so what we see actually happening, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes, is Santa as erotic daddy right? There's a, an abundance of romance novels coming out, which is called Santa Erotica. <laughs> and if you think about it, we've got this Santa coming down the chimney to sexually ravage the unsuspecting woman all snug in her bed. Now that may not be your bag or your cup of tea, but it is a thing, right? So this is interesting. These, are, these aren't truths, capital T. These are just things to think about, right? Like what is this fatherly figure or what is this lover figure that we've all kind of um, brought into our reality? Now Jung, who was a student of Freud, but later separated from him and created what, what is more known as archetypal psychology, he was more interested in, rather than the merely personal, the sort of collective and transpersonal nature of these rituals that we do. And he talked a lot about archetypes and he said archetypes are not themselves conscious but seem to be like underlying ground themes upon which conscious manifestations are sets of variation. Their presence is felt as numinous. That means of profound spiritual significance. Um, so he thought that the most powerful ideas in history all go back to archetypes. And he thought it was particularly true of religious ideas. For Jung, archetypes were alive. They had an energy. They were predispositions in our collective mind that causes us to create rituals, rites. They are longings, their motives, their patterns. So Jung saw the Santa myth, or I mean, I'm imagining he would have seen it, as just like this perfect screen for a wide variety of our collective projections to move out onto. There's this really awesome word in, in Jungian psychology. Well, it's used a lot in Jungian psychology called enantiodromia. It's a big one. And it, it, it is the boomeranging back effect. Well, it's actually the oppositional effect. So what does that mean? It means if, if there's a lot of death, we're going to want to bring in life. If there's a lot of destruction, we're going to need more hope and abundance. So it's this counterpole to things getting a little too far in any direction. So Santa is the counterpole response. He's like a father god, an all-knowing, omnipotent, omnipresent entity, right? He's also sort of the king of being everywhere, of bilocation. He's able to reach every kid's home on the special night with his low-tech sleigh and reindeer. He's also, as we imagine so many of the gods and goddesses of our, of our ancestors, he's, he's jolly. He almost looks like a big laughing Buddha. He's a father that can bring magic, make dreams come true. He embodies altruism and guidance. You know, He's just asking us to be good. He's also like a magician archetype. 
magically levitating up the chimney, able to do the whole planet for all the kids in one night. And he's also sort of a hermit and a wise man because he does this, but then he leaves and he goes where? To the North Pole. He goes there to be with his chosen few, right? And that we can think of the North Pole as the North Pole of our own mind or our consciousness, a cold, dark place that invites solitude and introspection. It likes to be withdrawn and intimate, And then it emerges hope-filled and and jolly and able to be in the realm of the human in the spirit of of the season, which is, is giving, right? Sacrifice. It won't surprise you to hear that I think Santa is also a little bit of the trickster archetype. I mean, there's a, there's something, and maybe it's the way he's depicted in modern culture, but he's sort of smiling a wise grin he's got a twinkle in his eye and and it's just truly comical to imagine this big belly getting stuffed down a tiny tube (laughs) called the chimney right he also has a mantra you guys know it it's ho 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 like what is that well it's the solar plexus it's the guttural sound of the belly and so in this way too santa is like all too human and I love that he's fat, right? It's like, hell yeah, I'm, I'm a man, you know, and I enjoy. I'm going to enjoy food and you're going to give me milk and cookies. <laughs> and so we have that element of the mythos as well, which is so cool because in so many myths, like if there's this divine giving, altruistic, you know, coming out of the sky, son, father, God, lover, God, He's giving so much that requires in mythology what's called like the energetic return, right? You, I give you all of this and, and we give him milk and cookies. We nurture him back. And so in this way, Santa's different from the, the, the mother god, the mother goddess. Y'all mamas out there know she gives and gives and gives and she actually doesn't require an energetic return. Can you imagine if you fed your baby and then you were like yo can you like do some housework it's the like maybe when they're older but that's the fathering energy and of course women and men have both of these but we're really going to stick to this fathering archetype of the season um and then you know what all great archetypes have is is like a polar opposite or an enemy and it's not that he's necessarily the enemy of santa well who's the polar opposite force of this character the Grinch, right? Ho, ho, ho is the mantra of Santa. Bah humbug is the mantra of the Grinch. And and remember, when we're talking about mythology, it's important to remember that we, that you, are all of the characters in this story. We get to be Santa, we get to experience that energy, and we get to be, when we need to, the Grinch. So I think being aware of of these archetypes, and and this is my interpretation. I've done a lot of research on it the past few weeks. I'm super into the mythology of seasons. And we're actually doing um, a winter winter webinar in Spirit Sessions. And as you guys know, we have January 18th coming up. What a great winter time to start this. Uh, We have Ayurveda school and it's happening. And I would love for you to come because as you can see, you know, such a big part of Ayurveda is learning how to live with the seasons. And I think there's this misunderstanding that that means to cook the perfect food for winter or put on the perfect oils for winter or do the perfect lifestyle habits for winter. And certainly those things can be supportive. But what we do at Ayurveda school here at Shakti is a little different. It's like, yes, those things are important and we need to learn them. But what is winter really doing to my psyche? What is happening in the root of all disease, which is the mind? What is going on in the depth of my soul? And how can I really support a returning to wholeness during winter through some of these seasonal myths 
And so if this sounds like something that you're interested in, today talking about Santa baby, it's just one example of where we go in our minds and our spirits in Shakti school. And there's more. There's so much more. I hope you guys can join us. And I hope this Santa story has made you think about the one really important message that Santa offers. He helps us, you know, heal from what our culture at large does. It goes through these empty motions of Christmas. It's like Christmas congealed. We may do the thing, right? Like we get the tree, we put on the lights, but is it just like one more thing on your to-do list? We buy the loved ones, the presents, but what Jung, what yoga, what Ayurveda, what so many deep traditions of mysticism ask us to do is have a ritualistic consciousness. Rituals are the way we can tame and reframe and direct our primary, primal, primary instincts, our sex instinct, our death instinct. Rituals help us be in right relationship to these forces. Rituals help us not deny our sex pleasure, nor deny our fear of death, but to enter into a realm where the ego becomes, here's how I want to put it. The ego takes its right place at the table, which is nested inside these bigger forces of sex, of death, of life, and in this tradition of Ayurveda, of lifetimes. Rituals protect us from hubris. Rituals protect us from egotism and greed. They help bring us back into relationship with the family, with the collective, with the depth of purpose and meaning. And my God, man, our culture is so sick. We have lost this. And because we've lost the sense of ritual, the sense of meaning, the sense of, in some ways, a psychological morality, our young people and our old are reaching to bad places to get their religion. <laughs> we, do, we don't want our old religions, many of us, and that's okay, but we must create new mythologies, new meaning makings for the soul. Otherwise, this impulse will not be denied and it will go and find a perverted place to nest. This is what happens when we see the rise in extremist political groups, in extreme ideological thought, both on left and right. We see our people looking for a place of belonging. And we go into what I know you've heard of, tribalism. This is a terrible place to live. It says, I need to gather with the people that think like me. This is my tribe. And the way we define ourselves is whether you are with us or against us. And my goodness, those are the ways in which war begins. This mythological way of thinking nests us within this greater, greater collective that every human being shares. Yes, we all have it. A ritual consciousness requires, you know this guys, if you've ever done a ritual, there's like this liminal space. So like this, I call it an awkward period between when the ritual starts, before it starts, and then when you get into it. And it requires a humbling. It requires a sacrifice. What are we sacrificing? Our mind, our ego, the, the everyday egoic way we live our life. Get up, do this, do that. Rituals say pause. Sacrifice the mind into the sacred quality of that which you don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in a ritual. And, and so in this way, our mind gets to live where it needs to be li living. And it starts to feel a bigger sense of belonging. The more we let this sacrificial take a place in our life, ironically, you know, the more we start to feel safe. Dreams were a huge part of the depth psychology process. Active imagination is akin to the tantric visualization. Working with dreams is one of my favorite techniques. Meditation, 
is an initiation into the unconscious. So let that be a part of the ritual of your winter. Jung said that the images of dreams have their own life, that they can guide us to our own inner saint and our inner wise woman. To quote him, he said, most of our difficulties come from losing contact with our instincts, with the age-old, unforgotten wisdom stored up in us. And where do we make contact with this old man in us in our dreams or this old wise woman in us in our dreams? He said, dreams are the clear manifestations of our unconscious mind. They are the rendezvous of the racial history and our current external problems. In our sleep, we consult with a two million year old man or woman, which each of us represents. We struggle with him and in various manifestations of fantasies. That is why I ask a patient to write up his dreams. Usually, they point the way for him as the individual. This is from Jung. I added the part about the woman. But no, you know, you and I live in a culture where dreams and death are disregarded. We toss out both the very old and the very young. The extent to which we aren't aware of this liberating power of death and dreams in winter is the extent to which we cannot fully relish in the pleasure of its counterpoint. By denying our need for meaning and for solitude and for intimacy, we miss out on the deeper archetypal message of guess who? Santa Claus. Who, as I've been slightly OCDing out on Santa, you know, there's one thing that I really think is his message. And that is, I will bring to you abundance in your coldest, darkest night. And all that I ask is that you remember your goodness. Remember, Santa is an energy inside of all of us. One of my, one of my psychology professors, Dr. Brandon Short, said, says, the soul loves to live in the particulars. We think that, you know, I was talking with Eden, one of my students, and on her podcast, which we're going to actually have a, a recording of later on in the month, but you know, we were talking a little bit after the recording of about rituals and, and how do we do them when we feel that the ones that we inherited no longer have meaning or we've never had them at all. We think our rituals have their roots in a religion, but we are wrong. Your rituals have roots in your flesh, in your psyche. So how can you reconnect to this deeper Santa myth and ritual this Christmas? How can you craft rituals that aren't empty but have this sort of red, sappy, real root? So I want to share this to close, and maybe this will support you. I, uh, over Thanksgiving, I was with my family sitting around the dinner table and y'all who listen to the podcast can imagine I I said hey guys like let's do this holiday ritual and I was you know a little nervous like some of my family members may may never have done that type of thing and and I didn't know how they would react and I didn't know if they would accept it and I could feel you know as I kind of walk through it like this nervous energy You may feel it too if you introduced a new ritual to your family. It can feel a little bit vulnerable. And I was wondering, you know, will my family reject the ritual or or reject me? Or, you know, will they even want to do this? And it was super, super simple. It was just write down one thing you're, you're willing to let go of from the old year and one thing you're calling in for the next. And like I said, I, I think maybe especially for my dad and it was like, a new way of contemplating and he had never maybe even written something of an intention down and my dad is a real real jokester you know and and he was kind of making fun and in you know sweet way like a light-hearted fun and and kind of coming up with fake fake things and everybody was sort of giggling and 
And then I played my role of like teacher taskmaster, you know, like, come on guys, we're doing this. Right. And, and, and they did it right. And, and my mom and dad and brother and sister-in-law and like family were like, they were doing it. Even baby Jack, six-year-olds, he's like writing some funny things down. And and my dad was the last and, and I was imagining in my mind that he had come up with something sarcastic or, or not taking it seriously, like a way of diverting from maybe his own feelings. But he didn't and he was the last to go and he looked up at all of us and then back down to his note card and, you know, my daddy's got a big old gruff sort of East Tennessee drawl. And he said, well, y'all know I didn't, I almost didn't make it out of here a few years back. And for me now, every day I have is just a bonus. And he looked back down to his note card and I could feel like tears coming to my eyes and I could sense them kind of coming to his, like, not like crying, right? But just like, you know, when a man you had don't really ever see cries, you can just feel the watery quality in his eyes and he looked down at that note card and I could see my dad's like very familiar handwriting and it and he looked down at it and and he read it and and it said I want to ha- I mean this is gonna make me cry he said I want to have an open mind and heart this year and what I don't know if I've ever shared on the podcast I've definitely shared it with the girls and women of Shakti school but Two Christmases ago, my dad almost died of a heart attack and and it was during COVID and like we couldn't go. We thought he was okay and his girlfriend called me and said so, but then she called me back a few hours later and she said he's still under anesthesia, like something went wrong. So my dad, and I know that this perhaps is so many of you, like we who lost people during COVID and like we couldn't even be with them. And so my dad, this whole like 24 hour period was under anesthesia, the surgeons attempting to save his life. And we were all just sitting and waiting. And I drove from Charlottesville to where my dad is in Roanoke, just wondering every mile that passed, like, is he still alive? And you know, thanks be to God, he did come to, and we were eventually able one at a time to go into the hospital. And, and when I went in, I I saw my dad and, and I will say to you guys, like, I've, I've never seen my dad cry. I actually, I've only seen my dad cry once. And that was at his mother's funeral. And I was really young, you know, maybe I was like eight or nine or six. I mean, I was young and that's the only time I've ever seen my dad cry. So I went into the hospital, you know, my dad had lost like 30 pounds in the course of like three days and, and we sat together and, and like, I don't know if my dad will listen to to this, but I know that he knows like it was one of the most sacred moments I've ever had with my dad because he was so soft and he was so vulnerable and he could barely talk because of all that had gone on in his throat and the breathing tube and the heart and but he was insisting to talk to me. And I was like, dad, you don't have to talk. You don't have to talk. And he he wanted to. And so he said, you know, here I am thinking he's going to tell me about how scary it was to die. And he pointed up at this wallpaper on the wall in the hospital. It was literally, guys, pink flamingos and like, cheesy Hawaiian palm trees on the wallpaper. And he said, it was just so beautiful, that wallpaper, when I was coming out of anesthesia. And he couldn't barely even finish the sentence. He was crying. And I, and it, and I knew what he meant. I knew what he meant. That just to be alive... To be able to look at the world, even if it was just the shittiest hospital wallpaper, (laughs) with like a reminder of life that is a 
freaking pink flamingo and and palm trees in Hawaii like he wanted to be here and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn for my father but that's how I interpreted it you know that my dad could feel the gratitude of being alive even more than the terror of dying So before we did this Christmas or Thanksgiving rather ritual, I, I, you know, I was, I was unaware that I was seeing my dad as that same old dad from my childhood before this intimate life changing brush with death, with father time. But through this very simple ritual we did, um, that my dad was willing to do that my brother, that my sisters were willing to do my mother, my baby Jack, I could realize and see like my dad isn't that that man that I have sort of etched into my psyche like a like a blurry bad tattoo. You know, the the note card ritual that I learned from Crystal, my therapist. <laughs> uh just that simple line of my dad wanting to have a more open mind. It 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 it, it showed me that he's somebody else. And in that moment, the whole room, or at least me, but I think the whole room, the whole family, as if kind of by magic, there was like a new energy, something closer to the feeling of a father's wisdom. And I felt like something was sort of reborn out of some old ashes of my old ignorance and maybe my dad's taste of death. And I think that's what a ritual can do so with that santa baby i wish you all such a beautiful winter season a wonderful winter solstice and i hope to see so many of you in january in our really sacred school that we've created on ayurveda wednesday nights 2 to 5 p.m we meet And if you can't come live, you can always watch it later. And I hope you'll join us. We're we're in the endeavor of learning Ayurveda, but way more importantly, we're in the endeavor of reviving the meaningful, the mythological, and the soul. Happy holidays. A big special thanks to Kevin Carlisle of Goodbye Gemini who wrote this beautiful podcast music and to DJ Juan Pablo Jimenez in Southern Spain for mixing it and making it magic. <laughs>